Hi, I'm Aaron, and this is Exploring Elixir Extra for Episode 2. In the main episode, we benchmarked Elixir 1.5 running in OTP 20 against Elixir 1.4 running in OTP version 18 for pattern matching of maps and ETS table performance. But the release of Elixir 1.5 and OTP 20, I think, are much more significant than just those two performance enhancements. Um, the release announcements were really quite long and listed a lot of things. I want to dig into those a bit more and explore it with a bit more depth, but the main episode is already getting rather long, so I decided to split it out into two with an extra that looks at you know some of the more detailed uh, features. So let's dig right in. Um, one of the first things I noticed is that Erlang is moving to all SMP all the time, and as a result, so is Elixir. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the Beam, for all of its you know vaunted um, reputation for concurrency and distribution, SMP support came fairly late, only in like 1998 as a result of a master's thesis project, and then it was improved incrementally over the years. Well, with OTP 20, the non-SMP builds are deprecated, and in OTP 21, they're just going to be removed altogether. This is nice because not only does it mean one less implementation detail to worry about, there's always going to be an SMP version of the Beam there for you to use, but it also means that the people working on the Beam VM can pretty much ignore, in going forward, um, the you know single CPU um, version of the Beam and, and can really focus on improving the SMP version without worrying about performance impacts elsewhere. So that's a really nice um, step forward for all of us in multi-core land, which is pretty much everybody now. Secondly, Unicode is invading every last nook and cranny of the Beam, which is great. That includes atoms. So um, in Elixir, you can now just write your atoms with um, non-Latin names, Unicode names. You don't even have to quote them. You can just type them straight in. I think this is a really nice touch for international developers. Uh, and it also removes one more kind of gotcha when you trans uh, change a string into an atom. Not that you should be doing that lots, but it, when we do, and it does happen, you no longer have to worry about, oh, am I only using Latin one characters? Crypto also saw an improvement, which is quite welcome. Uh, they upped the version of supported OpenSSL to 1.1. We all know that there's been lots of improvements and work on OpenSSL in the last couple of years, so it's good to see that being kept up. They've added hostname verification to SSL TLS connection setups. That's really good. SSH algorithms have also been updated, so older, less secure um, algorithms for the crypto have been dropped and newer, better, stronger ones have been adopted. So if you didn't know, the Beam actually comes with, or OTP comes with, support for SSH server and client built right in, which is awesome. Um, and this just makes it a little bit more secure. Finally, and this is really exciting, I think, uh, the next version of TLS, otherwise known as DTLS, is now in the Beam in beta. I've watched this being developed and kicked around for quite a while now. It's finally in the OTP releases, but as beta. Um, and in future releases, it'll move into you know full feature supported, um, you know stable. But this now allows more people to try it out, to test it, to bang around with it, perhaps put it into rotation in some limited fashion on production systems, um, which will really help mature. So so DTLS is not that far away at this point. All good news. And then the optimizations. As I mentioned in episode two, we looked at optimizations specifically in maps and in ETS tables. But I mean, there's just optimizations all over the place. So dirty schedulers are now enabled by default. So you don't have to turn them on anymore. Um, what is a dirty scheduler? Well, as you know, when you create a pro more than one process in Elixir, um, they're cooperatively, or sorry, preemptively scheduled. So one process gets to run for a little while on a CPU, and then it gets switched over to the other process. And this happens thanks to the schedulers in the Beam. Well, this is only possible for code that's actually written in Elixir or another Beam language. For natively implemented functions, or NIFs, uh, which are usually just C plugins, uh, it doesn't have this ability to, to pause it because this is just running native instructions on the CPU. So this is not a huge problem unless it's unable to uh, chunk up large jobs. So if it, if it takes more than, say, one millisecond to complete, 
And uh, the typical way of handling that is you just chunk that long job into many small ones. But some libraries and, and some operations just don't lend themselves to being chunked. And so you just have to run the whole thing and wait till it finishes. And anything over like one millisecond tends to pl play havoc with the um, schedulers and how they try and keep the latency fair and even and down and um, execution of processes well distributed. So the idea of a dirty scheduler was brought in and this allows um, functions that, especially NIFs, that take longer to say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a while, put me in this other scheduler. And so the Beam has dirty schedulers for both CPU bound tasks as well as IO bound tasks, so allowing them to schedule those separately. Um, and then once the um, function is done, it can then say, okay, I'm ready to come back into you know the same world of the normal schedulers. There is some overhead in that moving around, and I'm actually going to link to a really great blog entry about that overhead in the comments or in the description uh, below. So definitely check that out if you're interested in dirty schedulers. What's also really exciting is that uh, built-in functions, so functions like right inside of the beam that are written in C or OTP that are written in C, can now also be put into dirty schedulers and GC, garbage collection, that takes longer can then schedule itself as well. So if you have a, a um, very complex garbage collection in a long running um, process that needs to happen, it can say, this is probably gonna take more than a millisecond, so put me into a dirty scheduler, I'll come back later. Uh, this will really help keep the um, latency um, goals and that, that soft real-time nature of the beam there uh, across the board. It's really exciting stuff. PCRE, the regular expression library, is also upgraded to 8.4. Lots of bug fixes, better stack protection there. Timers have been vastly improved in terms of performance. So anything that uses timers and a lot of things do, we'll see some uh, improvements there. Again, for the soft real-time um, side of things, good news. This one is really huge for certain programs. This is the zero copy of literals and messages. So if you have a, like a literal string in your source code and you use that to uh, as part of a message that you pass to another process, up until now, it would be copied, deep copied, you know, a, a typical mem copy in C. Now, if that literal is in the code, it just passes a reference, which is just a little pointer, to that literal where it exists um, in, in the compiled uh, beam file. This is such a huge uh, improvement, um, especially for um, tools like Merle that create a lot of literals for, for message passing. Um, this is not so straightforward to implement if you think about it because the Beam also supports hot code reloading. And so what happens if you have one version of a module that has a string literal in it, and then you load a new one, a new version of that module that has a different string or no string at all. So there's some edge conditions that had to be taken into consideration during the implementation of this, but that's done um, and it's now in OTP 20. Uh, we looked extensively at the improvements in pattern matching of maps in episode two. Go check that out if you haven't seen it already. Um, but, you know, spoiler alert, um, there is anywhere from a 15 to 30% improvement on pattern matching of maps, depending whether you're doing it directly or using um, function headers. So that's really, really impressive. We also covered ETS or airline term uh, store. Uh, table improvements in the main episode, but it was more than just performance improvements. So they introduced a select replace function, which is an atomic compare and swap. Uh, I have had to work around this one more than once when using ETS tables. Now that we have this nice select replace built in, beautiful, one less thing to do by hand and it's gonna be more performed than you could ever write yourself, I'm sure. Secondly, there uh, are no um, hard limits on the number of ETS tables that you can use in a given VM now, um, it, well, other than RAM, of course. It used to be that this environment variable, URL max ETS tables, was your hard limit. And it was by default set quite low, so it was really easy to hit that limit. In fact, when I was benchmarking ETS table creation uh, in the main episode, I had to bump this up quite high uh, for the uh, Elixir 1.4 on OTP 18 benchmarks. Um, it, the environment variable is still there. It's still used by the Beam to do some initial um, 
optimization of internal data structures, but it's not necessary to set it. Um, you can now have as many ETS tables as you have RAM to throw at it. So it's a nice little thing. And then we looked at, in the main episode, this one, large ETS table optimizations. Um, this also includes creation. Creation of ETS tables was improved dramatically in performance. Um, and for uh, larger tables, you know, something with, say, 100,000 entries in it, you can see, or I was seeing anyways, um, a significant improvements in both uh, insertion as well as lookups. So you can go check out um, detailed uh, charts about those benchmarks in the main episode as well. As a bonus round kind of item, this is a small thing, but uh, I, I, I'm already, I can't go back already. I'm so used to it now, just in the last week or so of using it. So if you put um, export Earl A flags equals kernel shell history enabled, as you see there, um, this is just a, a um, uh, beam shell um, configuration bit. Uh, you can do this while you're in the REPL, no problem, but I just put this in my bash RC. And what it gives you is, well, shell history between runs. So when you exit the shell and come back into the shell, you just press your up key and you have uh, your shell history from the last run right there. This has already saved me so much time and annoyance. And I'm so used to this from, you know, other, you know, REPLs, other shells um, that I'm amazed that it took to 2017 to get it, but we have it now. Um, there were so many other improvements, however, um, I'm going to put links to the release announcements uh, in the description, as well as that blog entry on dirty schedulers um, and another uh, blog entry on how literals not being copied anymore between processes works in detail. So if you want to dig deeper, go ahead and read and we'll see you in the next episode.